directly feel free to mingle with them and talk to them about stuff that you're seeing in our presentation today um, and welcome so we know that mornings can be hectic and we are so grateful that all of you are here today I heard there was some crazy traffic so, um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> thank you to everyone for coming here today thank you for bearing the traffic um, and along the theme of minimalism right now um, we just want to take a moment to just kind of let everyone decompress for a second and take a deep breath and there we go um, we're just going to show you some images around the theme of minimalism that inspire us So those images are things that we pulled from different projects, inspiration images that we had. And a lot of the things that go into making a minimal space can be a very complicated detail. This is a detail I stole off of Randy's desk. There is a place for minimalism in our process, and it's kind of a tool in our tool belt. It's one of the things that we look at to help us focus on a problem, to help get out the distractions and really see the purity of a material to think about how we want to approach something. Um, so there's a place for minimalism and for um, complexity. Complexity is great, and it has um, you know, a lot of character. It brings a lot of different connotations with it, um, and it makes the world very rich and diverse and interesting. Um, so we don't want to say that we don't appreciate complexity, because we really do. But for the purpose of today, we're going to put complexity to the side. We can you know, come back and have a conversation about complexity another day um, and really just focus on what minimalism is to us and how we can use it in a way to enrich our lives. Um, so we came up with some ideas of how we frame minimalism. And this quote kind of summed it all up. Minimalism is not the lack of something. It is simply the perfect amount of something. Um, so it doesn't mean that it's a complete empty void. It's just the right amount. And we all learned this when we were little kids with the three bears, right? There was a little bit too much, the bed was too hard, a bit too soft, not enough, a porridge. Um, we learn it as young children that you kind of want just the right amount. You want to strike a balance. Um, so in our daily lives, we're always struggling to find a balance. You have budgets, you have schedules. I know people are always running around trying to do a lot. The calendar's look booked. This is like basically a screenshot of one of my screens. <laughs> You're always kind of like handling all of this stuff. Um, so we were gonna talk about minimalism in terms of time a little bit today. Minimal distractions. And how can you limit some of your distractions so that you can really focus. And we're also gonna talk about um, minimal time. Um, so distractions can be in the workplace and thinking about focus in the workplace. Time can be more personal to your daily, how you're balancing your work-life balance. And then we're gonna also look at minimal waste and think about sustainability. And minimal waste is just, you know, we're trying to capture the breadth of sustainability in a few words and it's not just about waste, it's much more comprehensive than that. Um, so it's also, you know, energy use, all of those aspects. But 
this was an easy way to sum it all up for us today. Um, so really thinking about distractions. Um, we are a very research-driven firm. We like to think about design, and every time we approach a design problem, um, we're constantly challenging ourselves with, what did we learn from this project? How can we apply this? Are we seeing trends between projects? Are we seeing things that, you know, this came up on a project, and we didn't know the answer at that time, but we really want to take some time to study that and understand it more deeply, so we can come up with a really good answer for how to handle that issue. Um, in Gensler, we have internal grants that we give, and any employee can apply for a grant and study a topic of their choosing, and we propose grant proposals once a year. I worked on a grant where we studied aging um, within the population and how that's gonna affect the way people live. How does it affect transportation? How does it affect housing? How does it affect major <coughs> spaces? Um, and it was really exciting because on my research team, we had people from Japan, um, there was a guy from China, there was a woman from LA. So we got a lot of different perspectives. Japan is aging quicker than America is. So we were able to study what's happening in their population and seeing what we can anticipate here. So research is very much a part of what we do. So going back to minimalism and distractions, um, there's a research study that was done by Gensler and we started it a couple, 2005 we did the first version of it and we've been updating it and it's our workplace study. So we study how people interact at work and what are different um, things that they're seeing in the workplace as the workplace evolved. So in the 2013 study, we learned a lot of things. Um, we learned about 54% of people say they spent, or I'm sorry, 54% of the time spent on focus work. And you guys all know that. You know, you have a deadline, you need to really concentrate. If you're a lawyer, you might need to read a brief. If you're a photographer, you're editing in Photoshop and like getting rid of little lines. If you're a writer, you know, you might be editing your own work. Um, there's always very focused work in every profession. And we also found in the same survey that 53% of people said when they're in their workplace, they are distracted and not able to do their focus work. Um, we've been doing open collaborative work design for a long time. So we've had the chance to see the good and the bad of those situations and then figure out when do you want to have an open space? Like how does that need to work to function well? So we kind of identified within a workspace you want to have four different modes of working. And those modes are collaborative. That one's easy. It's a lot like the space. You make a really nice space, you put a lot of people in it. Collaboration is, you know, marker boards, things like that, it's, um, create collaborative space. Learning, learning is very important. Learning doesn't just happen when you're in school. We're lifelong learners, and we're seeing that in every different type of profession that we work with. Our clients are doing a lot of continuing education. In order to keep up with the changing world, they're spending a lot of time on learning. So how do you incorporate learning into a work day or a work environment? Socializing. This one is one that I feel like can be a trigger for people at first because they're like, we don't want people wasting time. We don't want our employees slacking off. But socializing is very critical to the way people work. The way you study how monkeys learn, it's through social interactions. You know, in biology, there's a lot of studies about how learning happens. Um, so socializing is a key factor in a workplace because interactions happen when you least expect it. It could be when you're at the coffee machine, you run into somebody you don't sit next to or who's working on a different type of project or in a different department, and you might start chatting about something and realize, oh, there's a commonality in what we're doing. There's something interesting about what this person's sharing that's gonna somehow influence what I'm doing. It might not happen immediately. It might happen a month later, like, oh my God, I forgot Bob was saying that, and I should go find Bob again so I can you know, talk to him about some issue. So socializing is very critical to a workplace. And then focus. So all spaces need to have variations in a variety of types so that you have a mixture of these different types of environments. But we found that focus is kind of different than everybody else because it's a little bit more, not complicated to create, but it you know requires a different set of solutions. And different people focus in different ways. So we're seeing there's generational gaps, between the way people like to focus. There's changes in personalities. Um, based on the way that you work and your style of working, it might differ. 
So some people like to have headphones in, sit in a very crowded place, so you're with people, but you're not necessarily interacting with them. Some people like to have a quiet room where they can go and just kind of really, you know, heads down. Some people focus best when they're by a window. Um, we have a couple of people in our office who will come and they'll bring their laptop over and sit in the windows and they're kind of working on their laptop, staring out the window a little bit, thinking, going back to their laptop, working a little bit, um, and that's the way that they focus best. So variety is really important. And we also find that focus is something that is iterative. You're gonna go, you know, maybe you have a big project coming up and you'll have a meeting. So you're gonna wanna have some time to focus, gather your thoughts, think about it a little bit, and then you're gonna go collaborate with the bigger group. And you're gonna have a little bit of knowledge based already, you're prepared so that you can have a good conversation. You're gonna brainstorm, collaborate, um, who knows what's gonna come out of that. And then all of that information that you've created together, at some point somebody or a small group of people are gonna go back and refocus, and digest it, learn a little bit from what they did as a bigger group, process it, and then take it to the next level, and then you collaborate again. So it's this constant iterative process of going back and forth between the focus mode and your collaborative mode. Um, so we found that there's three steps to really creating these great workspaces. One is provide effective focus space. So in order to do that, you need to have a good noise level. Can't be too loud, can't be too quiet, somewhere in between. If there's music blasting, you might not be able to concentrate on what you're reading, but some background noise and some good music could be a great add functionality. You wanna have comfortable chairs, you wanna make sure there's plugs where people need them, you wanna make sure that people have the tools that they need to be able to do whatever work they're doing. And then the design and look and feel of it really matters too. Because if you're not comfortable and you don't feel relaxed, it's really hard to focus. If you feel cramped or if you, you know, are in a dark place or just depressing, like, no, you get distracted, your mind's gonna go off. So you can't focus when you're in an uncomfortable looking environment. So that's actually a very important factor. So here's an example of a woman focusing. And this kind of goes to the idea that it doesn't have to be an enclosed room. It could be an open space. There could be other things going on, but an environment that allows it. And like I was saying, we create a variety of environments that do that. They don't all look the same. The second step is you want to collaborate without sacrificing focus. So we don't want to, it's not an either or situation. Collaboration is really important and key, but we want to do both. So if you have large collaboration spaces, or like our studio, we have a big studio where everybody is sitting together, we have breakout rooms. So we have these two small meeting rooms that are behind the pantry. And those rooms, you can have a phone call if you need to take a private phone call. You can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting if you want to have a discussion about something. You don't want everybody to hear about it. There's a space for that. Um, it can come in a lot of scales. These one-on-one -on -one rooms, telephone rooms, small meeting rooms, all create the options and variety so that people can break away when they need to. So it's really important to have those. Um, circulation and support spaces are important. So your hallway is not just a hallway anymore. It can do more. Um, transition spaces have small meeting areas. That way when you have, you know, we did one thing and we called them bump and greets. So it's kind of like you bump into your friends and you can like hang out and talk for a while. Maybe there's like a tall, you know, stand and you could just kind of lean on it, perch there for a little while, put your coffee down from, you know, what you're carrying when you're walking, have that conversation and then the other person keeps going. Um, and office amenities are also important. The coffee and water coolers, you know, that's, there's a reason why it's so cliche. They work, you know, people have conversations in those places. Um, so here's an example of a space that was done and you can see it's like a lot of different pathways are coming together. This is a place where that hallway is becoming more of a hall than a hallway. It opens up. So you have a space in between those hallways that allows for some individual work at a higher um, table. Those women are collaborating at the lounge furniture. You know, those guys are kind of just doing that bump and greet thing where they ran into each other and they're perching for a second. And then the third thing is drive innovation through choice. Um, we have so many options and technology has given us so much freedom and that's a great thing. So how can employers in places of work provide options to their employees in a way that allows them to maximize their time and efficiency and do what they're there to do. So a variety of spaces is important. Giving people tools, 
you can't you know, be mobile and come to the window if you have a hard desktop and your computer's there. So the laptop is important. PDA devices, um, cell phones, there's so much power in what we can do now in a mobile device. So giving those kinds of tools to employees. So thinking about technology and how you integrate technology is becoming more important in the design of spaces. So when we do a project, we often pair up with the technology teams and talk to the IT department of a company or their vendors and say, okay, what are you guys doing so that we can coordinate and make sure that we're providing the power and resources that you need for your devices and the spaces that we're creating. And then policies. Um, ambiguity can be disarming. If people don't know what they're allowed to do, then they might not try it or do it. If you know people weren't you know, encouraged and it was an open policy that, yeah, you can take a break, go run an errand, go do something, sit by the window, then people wouldn't think to do it. You don't wanna be worried that, okay, my boss doesn't see me at my desk, so he's gonna think I'm not working. Um, so making sure that you have a clear policy so that everybody knows what the expectation is, is really important. It's all about communicating freely so everybody's on the same page. So this is a space that has a lot of variety. Um, it has a lot of choice. The help desk is great because people are able to come together. Um, this woman has you know, her own personal workspace, but there's a chance to collaborate with the beanbag chairs. There's the gaming in the back, so that's the idea that you know, as long as there's a policy, people know they can take that break. You can play at work. It's not a forbidden thing. How do you incorporate that into your day? Um, so choice environments are really key, and we're gonna use our space we're really excited to be here, have this new space to share with you guys, excited that you guys get to see it. So we're gonna use this a little bit as an example of how we use this space as a choice environment. Um, this is a cut off floor plan of where we're at. So you guys are sitting in this room. We have these great curtains over here, and they are three layer curtains. It's got a felt layer, an acoustical plastic liner, and then a fabric panel. So you can see the tracks. This room can get subdivided into two rooms. It could get into one giant conference room, depending on how you pull the curtain. So we can create a variety of different environments in here and create different size meeting rooms. So there's a lot of um, movement of the curtain and you can make another meeting room over here, depending on if you pull this curtain. Excuse me. And then we have our open studio space. Along this wall here is our library. We have these sliding panels um, that are our pinup space. This is a little bit minimalistic. Um, it's a very simple palette, and we really let the work be our color and our art. So on our walls, we have, you know, we're constantly doing a lot of work and um, putting stuff up. So that's um, really fun. And then in this room, we've done, you know, Zumba parties. We've done um, the meeting rooms. We've had large meetings. We also have, you know, our bar is really multifunctional. We've had parties there. You'll see people marking up drawings. We've had meetings there. A lot of people eat lunch there. It's a very multifunctional space. Um, and then we have the choice environments, the places for people to focus in the small meeting rooms. Over here, if there's not a meeting, it becomes a very quiet, nice getaway space. And then Stephanie's gonna talk about minimal time. Okay, everyone hear me? Maybe? Yes. Um, so, one thing that we all know is that we have minimal time. We get 24 hours a day and that is it. You better get yourself done in those 24 hours. So, I was kind of really interested in, okay, we, we only have these 24 hours. We have so much to do every day. How are we breaking down our days to make sure that we're balancing them out? We have these really high stress times. How are we making sure that we have those low stress to yourself times? So um, I actually found some research online where they went and documented um, famous people throughout history and their creative processes, how they spent their day. So I'm gonna use my friend Corb here. So this is how Corb spent his day. He would get up, <coughs> he would do exercises, and then he'd spend the morning with his wife, coffee, breakfast, um, and then he took time to himself to contemplate, do art, drawings, um, Corb was a Architect, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, so he would spend his day, or the um, first part of his work day, really in contemplation. And then, the second part of his day, he would go ahead and imp implement those thoughts and ideas that he's come up with. And then he goes home and spends the rest of the night. 
night at home with his wife. Um, so as you can see, there's, there's a good balance that Clark has in the state here. Um, so it made me think, I'm like, okay, how am I balancing my day to make sure that I'm not, you know, doing eight hours of work and burning myself out too quickly? So I was like, okay, if Corb can do it, I can do it too. So I'm, I, I went ahead and planned my day. <laughs> spend a few hours in the morning focusing, getting stuff done. Um, and then around lunchtime, luckily we have the flexibility here and the resources around to go for a walk or go up to Lafayette Gardens and hang out in the gardens for a little bit or go along the river walk. Just spend that time in nature and really getting away from my desk, getting away from the work, getting away from the stress. And then in the afternoon, um, definitely do some work. Might head out for another walk, run some errands. And then you know, maybe a little happy hour. Everyone wants a happy hour. I mean, we've got the bar for it. Um, and then bike home, maybe go for a run or a walk, and spend my evening with family and friends. So, well, yeah, I was like, okay, I balanced my day pretty well. Um, but it's, it's not something that's super intuitive to people, to plan ahead and say, okay, I need to make sure today I meditate, or I need to make sure today I take five minutes away from my desk. So we have this really traditional idea of work and play. Kind of you spend your days, your Monday through Friday, eight to five, you're at work and you are working and that's it. And then maybe you come home in the evening, you can do your play, you can rest, you can hang out, um, and then of course on the weekends. Well, what I feel I'm experiencing, I feel like with a lot of people um, in my generation, are experiencing is this nice blend of work and play. It's there's no um, there's no strict lines between work and play, and we're really seeing spaces that are starting to support this blend between <coughs> work and play. So we call them restorative environments. And these are environments where you can still be at work, but get away from your desk for a little bit. Um, so this is a client that we have out in California, and they came to us saying, hey, we've got these employees, they work so hard, they burn themselves out. We need to find a way to incorporate these restorative environments into our office. Um, they actually have a campus of office, offices. So we're like, okay, we gotcha. Um, why don't we bring your employees outdoors? Well, let's also bring the outdoors inside to your employees. So what we did is we created these awesome biking and walking trails throughout the campus. Um, these sandy beach areas, it makes you feel like you're on the beach while you're at work, how cool is that? Um, you can play volleyball, there's like a little cafe seating. So it's really that chance to step outside your door and already be in a good environment that really restores you. And then we brought the, in, the outside inside. Um, we did this really cool um, office tree fort with this really nice wood that makes you feel closer to nature and a really nice skylight where you can see the sun and see the weather. Um, and that just makes such a big impact on how people work. So we also um, incorporated more play environments for them. So off to the side here, you can see this girl probably on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's just taking a moment away from her desk to uh, maybe, maybe check her Facebook, maybe, uh, Check out some cat videos. Um, <laughs> just just that time away from your desk, and look, she's surrounded by people walking, biking, just kind of out there eating lunch. Like, it's just a really great restorative environment. And then we've got some girls over here in um, a game room playing some Scrabble. And it's just a really nice blend between <coughs> work and play. I know we do it here a lot. These tables actually make really great ping pong tables. <laughs> um, and these uh, glass boards back here and right here. Um, great for office Pictionary. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really blending that work and play. So here's um, a lot of our restorative environments throughout the office. So we've got these great bankettes that some of you are sitting in right now overlooking the river and I'll tell you, those have saved my life because my InDesign will crash and I will have a proposal due tomorrow and the printer's not working and I'm like, oh, what do I do? And everything that's worked out, we know it all gets worked out. But five minutes in that window will call me, take me back to that 
restorative place, and then I can go back with a logical mind and realize I've got my printer settings wrong, and everything turns out okay. Um, but really just having that moment to step aside and gather myself is so important, and it lets me approach stuff from a much more calm, even-minded place. And then um, I know some of you have been out there. If you haven't, please, um, I encourage you to go check it out. We've got this awesome porch where you can go outside and you can feel what the weather is like, what the temperature is. If we're on the 17th floor, like, so far away from the ground, half the time it's like, eh, the ground's too far away, I'm not going outside today. But this nice porch really mm -hmm. lets you go outside, you, you feel like you're not even in the office anymore. And um, again, just that restorative environment. And then we've got these great amenities around us as well. This is Lafayette Gardens, and this is, um, we did a bike, trip, a bike trip to Belle Isle um, about a month ago with our wellness week. So just having those amenities and having those like programs available for your employees, it just really allows more concentration and focus. So I'm going to breeze through, because we said we were going to talk about sustainability. Um, just to let you know, we are very sustainable conscious. Our space is going to be a LEED certified space. We have LED lighting in here. Andrew and Fessel um, were the designers of some of those lighting systems. They can tell you more about the daylight harvesting if you want to have a conversation with them afterwards. Um, we did this great LED task light. Um, tell you about that if you're interested. We designed these really um, amazing kind of solar shades for uh, a desert environment that didn't have a lot of water. So we looked at how can you, you know, provide shade, control the wind, capture rainwater, and I can tell you more about that later. So as a bonus, um, we are very collaborative, not only internally, but externally, and we like to work with partners. So my friend Andy Kem, when I heard that we were doing something at minimalism, I was like, Andy's furniture is a great example of minimal. He took one piece of plywood and made a chair. There's almost um, zero waste. Um, it's a wow. very efficient design, it's very beautiful. Um, so we asked him to bring in some chairs so we could have them. So I can tell you more about him and give you his contact information too. So wow. thank you.